This is going to be an overview of the book of Philippians. The author is the Apostle Paul. The time is 62 to 64 AD. It's 104 verses, around 2,183 words and four chapters. So it's a pretty short book. Historically, you know, we got our three applications, and the first one, historically, Paul writes to this church to thank them and inform them and encourage them. Inspirationally, what can we get out of it? You know, inspirationally, we can focus on Jesus Christ, and if you do, you can have joy in your Christian life. Doctrinally, Jesus Christ is our pattern, and the Bible gives us His mind. So, what's ten principles we can learn from the book of Philippians to make us a strong Christian? I, I heard a preacher say this a while back about this book, and I wrote them down. And he gave ten principles on Philippians to make a, uh, that you can get from Corinthians to make you a strong Christian. Number one, God saved you for a purpose. Philippians 1.6 God saved you for a purpose. Philippians 1.6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You're, you're saved for a purpose. The next one, We live for him, and to die is a good thing. Philippians 1.21 We live for him, we live for the Lord, and to die would be a good thing. It says in Philippians 1.21, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If you lived your life that way, you're going to be happy. Because you're not living for self, you're living for God, and you're not worried about death, because to die would be a gain for you. Because you're going to heaven. Number three, uh, you get God's mind out of his book. Philippians 2.5 it says in Philippians 2, 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You get Jesus Christ's mind when you read his book. He is the word. He's the living word. The Bible is the written word. Number four, everyone will bow to Jesus Christ eventually. Philippians 2, 10, That at the name of Jesus... Every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Everybody's going to bow eventually. You might as well go ahead and do it now. You might as well go ahead and get saved. And then after you're saved, you might as well go ahead and bow down to Jesus Christ and just serve Him in all aspects of your life. Number five, another principle, that I may know Him which is salvation, have power, suffer his reproach, be more like Christ. You see that process, that I may know him, that's your salvation, and then have power, you don't get power till after you get saved, suffer his reproach, that is take up your cross and follow Jesus, and be more like him. That's the process. That should be your Christian growth there. Philippians 3.10 says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death that if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Number six, get past the past. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So a great principle for you in your Christian life. Forget about those things that are behind. Quit dwelling on the past. You can't go back and do better. You can't go back and change it. Press Toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Finish well. You don't know how many years you got left. You could be 70 years old and still have 20 years left. Imagine if you served God for that next 20 years. Obviously, you couldn't do as much 
in your old age, most likely, as you could as a young person. But imagine if you're 70 years old and you read the Bible one time a year for the next 20 years, that's 20 times. If you witness to one person a day for the next 20 years, that's thousands of people you'll witness to. Press toward the mark. Forget those things which are behind. Don't think about how much time you've wasted. Just stop wasting time right now. Number seven, perfect peace is only through the Lord. Philippians 4, 7, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. True peace is only through the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll be in perfect peace if your mind is stayed on Him. Number eight, learn to be content. Philippians 4, 11, Paul says, Not that I will speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you've got going on, no matter how things are going in your home or what you have, what, uh, your, uh, your material possessions, just be content with it. With food and raiment, let us be there with content. Number nine, through Christ, you can do all things. In Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Number ten, God shall supply all your need. In Philippians 4.19, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He's going to supply your need. So there's no need to worry. So those are ten principles from Philippians to make us strong Christians. Ten, ten things to live by. Now let's just get into the book and just examine it chapter one in chapter one paul has the philippians in his heart and they get boldness seeing his suffering for the lord paul wants to be with the lord but he knows he's still needed by the saints down here he's going through struggles down here getting beat whipped put in prison and it's just a rough life for him but he knows that he's needed down here He says in Philippians 1.15, Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. When some men preach, they only cause envy and strife. Their followers are the most envious and the most striving people that you can be around. They cause contention and divisions. In Philippians 1.16 and 17, Paul says, The one preach Christ of contention not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds. His bonds, he's in prison. And they're just making it harder on him. And then it says, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. You see, a lot of these guys that only preach Christ of contention, their preaching only adds affliction to the preachers who preach Christ of goodwill. And Paul says in Philippians 1.21, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If you're saved, then don't see dying as a bad thing. The Lord doesn't. He doesn't see you dying as a bad thing. Uh, Paul didn't see it as a bad thing. It says in Psalm 116 and verse 15, Precious, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. It says in Philippians 1.22-24, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose I won't not, for I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to, to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. You see, Paul didn't see dying as a bad thing. He thought that was better than actually going on in this world. He says, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. You know, there's some people that we're better off with them here. You see, when certain saints leave, uh, that that's harder on us because we needed them here to edify us. And if your pastor dies, you know, that's good for the Lord and it's precious in the sight of the Lord when a saint dies. But in a sense, it was more needful for 
you for him to stay here. Because a lot of times a pastor dies and then you get a pastor that doesn't even believe the Bible, doesn't even uh, care about you like the other one did, doesn't edify you as much, doesn't teach you the Bible. That's the way Paul felt. You know, he was their spiritual mentor. He was edifying in, edifying them in the Lord. And he, he knew that if he died, you know, they're not going to have somebody like him, as good as him around, to give them the Bible and the gospel. He, so he says, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. It would be better to just die and go to the third heaven with Jesus Christ. But if you're not dead, then there is somebody out there that needs you, and that's why you're still here. And if you're still here, then you're here for a reason. So what is that reason? You need to be doing what you're supposed to be doing. Chapter 2. Uh, in this chapter, Paul tells the Philippians to put others first. And this is what Jesus Christ, our example, did. Jesus took seven steps downward to the cross. <clears throat> seven steps downward. You know, Jesus Christ left heaven. He left the riches of heaven. He came down in the flesh and he took seven steps down. In Philippians 2, 7 through 8, the first step down is made himself of no reputation. Number two, he took upon himself the form of a servant. Number three, made in the likeness of men. Number four, found in fashion as a man. Five, he humbled himself. Six, became obedient unto death. Seven, even the death of the cross. Took seven steps down. This chapter should show you that you need to put others first, just like the Lord Jesus Christ did. Let each esteem others better than themselves. It says in Philippians 2, 3, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. A lot of so-called Christians work. All their work is done through strife. A major part is done through vain glory. Some Christians are so in love with their own performances that if they got a clone, they'd, they'd just change sexual preferences and leave their wife for their own clone. That's how much in love with their self they are. If they could clone themselves, they would marry their clone because they love their self so much. Paul said, In lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Did it ever occur to you that nobody is better than anybody? You need to get so low that you treat other people better than you do yourself. If you're treating people better than you do yourself, you're not going to have to worry about strife. You're not going to be striving with people. You're not going to be struggling with vain glory. A lot of times, I'll take it too far the other way. I feel like everyone is so much better than me that I, I really don't even have a, that I feel like I don't even have a right to speak to a lot of them. And that's not right either. You can get around some people and you feel like, man, these people are so much better than me. I, I don't even deserve to be in the same room with these people or breathe the same air as they're breathing. Uh, that's the way I feel a lot of times. That's taking it too far the other way. And nobody's better than anybody. If you think about it, we're all the same flesh. First Peter one twenty four says, For all flesh is as grass. Uh, we all went astray as soon as we were born, speaking lies. Psalm 58, 3. We all die one day. Hebrews 9, 27. As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Romans 3, 22 through 23. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We are all sinners that needed a Savior. And Jesus died for you just as much as he died for anybody else. So, people aren't better than you. And you're not better than other people. But you ought to treat people better than yourself. Philippians 2, 4. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. You see? Well, that's just completely foreign to Christians today. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. This not only will help your Christian life, it will help your married life. Imagine if the, both spouses 
was worried about each other's needs instead of their own. And men are notorious for just not worrying about their spouse's needs a lot of times. They just do their own thing. They'll get up, uh, go to work, don't even care about the kids, don't care about the wife. Then they get home and the kids want to see them, but they go do something else. They go hunting or fishing. They go out with the guys. They have no time for their children. They have no time for their wife. They look They look on their own things. They come home and play a video game. If they have a day off, they'll play a video game for 14 hours. But the Bible says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And Galatians 6, 2 says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. You should bear one another's burdens. And you can take that too far. You can bear someone's burden so much to where you become their crutch, and then you're actually causing them to stay in a burden. And that's why Galatians 6, 5 says, For every man shall bear his own burden. Bear one another's burdens, but sometimes they will let you bear their whole life and let you just carry them on on your back their whole life look on the things of others but then that person's going to have to learn to carry their own weight and if you act as their permanent crutch they're just going to get weaker and weaker philippians 2 5 and 6 let this mind be in you which was also in christ jesus who being in the form of god thought it not robbery to be equal with God. You see, he didn't have any problem being equal with God. He didn't have any problem with people worshiping him and believing that he was God because he is God. How can you be equal with the Almighty God that the Bible describes and not be God yourself? You see, I, I see a lot of these people saying that Jesus was equal with God, but he wasn't God and he was a created being. Okay, how could he be equal with God, with Almighty God, and not be God? Think about what you're saying. In Philippians 2, 7 and 2, 8, it says, But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Notice that God manifested himself in the flesh, and took upon him the form of a servant. Dying for someone on the cross is the greatest example of putting others before yourself. It, you couldn't get a greater example. In John fifteen thirteen, it says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. In Philippians 2, 9, it says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name. Notice it said he humbled himself, and look what happened. He was exalted. It says in Luke 14, 11, For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. What's the chapter about? You get down low, you lower yourself, you put others ahead of you. Then what's going to happen? God's going to exalt you. It says in Philippians 2, 10, 11, That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Think about how it says every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You're going to hear that out of the mouth of the most wicked men that you've read about in the Bible. The most wicked men that you've heard of in history, when they get up there, at the great white throne judgment. You're going to hear Jesus Christ is Lord. Out of their mouth. Out of the mouth of Cain. Out of the mouth of Ahab. Out of the mouth of Jezebel and Haman. The devil. The antichrist. The false prophet. All the Herods. All the pharaohs. All the kings of Israel and Judah. All of them. You're going to, you're going to have to do it. If, if you're not saved. And you're denying Jesus Christ right now. There's going to be a day when you get caught up to the judgment or the great white throne judgment and you're going to say Jesus Christ is Lord. You might as well go ahead and get saved right now. The thief on the cross says, Lord, remember me. Why don't you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord? Why don't you come to him as a guilty sinner 
realize that he died on the cross for your sins and trust in him and what he did for you on the cross to be your payment for sin. You might as well do it now because you're going to bow down and say Jesus Christ is Lord. But then it'll be too late and you're going to be cast into the lake of fire. Philippians 2.19 But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. He knows their standing. Their standing in the Lord is perfect. He wants to know their state. You see, you got your standing and you got your state. Your standing is perfect. It can't be changed. It can't be corrupted. It can't get sin on it. Now you're, but your state is another story. Paul knew they were saved. He knew their standing was good, but he was concerned about their state, how they were living from any given moment. How are they doing in their walk at that moment? It says in Philippians 2, 20 through 21, For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. Back to the theme of the chapter. People are seeking their own. They're not putting every everybody else first. They're concerned with their own things and not the things of others. They're not following Jesus Christ's example. That's a problem today. Men are worried about their own lives. But the Lord Jesus Christ has been put on the shelf. The Bible has become something you see on your great-grandmother's bookshelf. She doesn't read it either and hasn't read it for years. And the only time you think about it is when you see it there. In your mind, that's just an old fogey thing. But this Bible is alive. It's like, imagine if every day you woke up and you got a newspaper from 10 years in the future, from a day in the future, from a year in the future. That's what it's like. That's what you've got. When you wake up in the morning, you open the book. It's like a newspaper that's for the present, and it's got the future wrote out. It's not just an old fogey thing. It's not outdated. Now, chapter 3. In this chapter, Paul talks about forget the things which are behind, reaching forth into those things which are before, press toward the mark for the prize, Follow Paul and like-minded men all the way until the rapture when the Lord will change your vile body. It says in Philippians 3, 4, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. You see, a lot of people trust in the accomplishments of their flesh and use it to get people's attention or to put their confidence in those accomplishments. Uh, Paul is about to show you that he has accomplished more in the flesh than just about anybody, yet he doesn't have confidence in the flesh. So he's not saying this to brag. He's saying it to prove a point. He's like, these guys out here, they got confidence in the flesh. They're talking about their accomplishments. Well, I'm going to show you I got more accomplishments and more credentials than they do. But the thing is, I'm not even trusting in those things. In Philippians 3, 5 through 8, Paul says, circumcise the eighth day. He says that for those who want to make a big deal about circumcision of the stock of Israel. For those who look down on the Gentiles, you see, he's, a, he's of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, an Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. You see, the Pharisees, they knew the law, but Paul knew the law better than they did, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which was in the law, blameless. When he, uh, back when he thought keeping the law made you righteous, he came out blameless concerning the law. But then he says, but what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. He counts all that stuff he ever did as dung. It wasn't any good. None of it was for the Lord. None of it got him righteousness. Even the good works you do, when it comes to you getting salvation or keeping salvation, it's, it's nothing but dung. You know, you ought to do good. We should do good. We should do good works. But when it comes to earning you salvation, when it comes to you keeping salvation, when it comes to they prove, saying that they prove your salvation, 
It's, it's dung. The only works that matter is the works Jesus Christ did and the righteousness Jesus Christ has. And that's the righteousness that's on your record. I don't want any of the righteous works that I've done to go on my uh, record in the sense of God judging my salvation by those things because it's not going to be good enough. My righteousness is not good enough to get me saved, to keep me saved, or to prove I'm saved. The righteousness of Jesus Christ is good enough to get me saved, to keep me saved, and to prove that I'm saved. You see, that's the only righteousness that I'm counting on. So he counts all that stuff he ever did as dung. It wasn't any good. So he's counting all that stuff before he was saved as dung. And then in the present, he says, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Paul's not thinking of himself highly before he was saved. He's looking back at all those works he did, and he's like, it's all dung. Then in the present, and when you get to the book of Romans, in the present time that he's in, he says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? In Philippians 3, 9, he says, And be found in him, in Jesus Christ, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Jesus Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. You see, the righteousness he wants on his record, which he has on his record because he's saved, is the righteousness of God, which he got by faith. He says, not having mine own righteousness. You see, all these people going around going around trying to establish their own righteousness, and they've not submitted themselves into the righteousness of God. All that's going to matter one day is if you have the righteousness of Jesus Christ on your soul, and if you don't, and you're going to hell because your righteousness, your own personal righteousness that you get from living a good life, doing good works, and abstaining from bad works, those are good things, but it ain't doing nothing for you when it comes to your salvation. He says in Philippians 3, 20 and 21, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So at the rapture, this vile body, notice it's a vile body. It's a sinful body. Uh, that barely makes it. It's fragile. The body can die so easy. It's so sl It gets so slow when you're tired. It gets so weak when you're hungry. It's fragile. It's not perfect at all. If you think you're arrived and you got sinless perfection, look in the mirror and look at this vile body, especially when you wake up in the morning. If you're perfect... Look at yourself. You think you're perfect? Look at yourself in the morning. It, you got sin written all over you. It's a sinful body. But it will be changed. Our vile body shall be fashioned like unto his glorious body. It says in 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty one through 55, Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Your body's got to be changed. The corruptible's got to put on incorruption. The mortal's got to put on immortality. Now chapter 4. Anything God wants, to, uh, wants us to accomplish is possible through Jesus Christ. If God wants you to do something, then it's possible through Jesus Christ. And Paul also talks about think on things that are honest, just, pure, lovely, and of good report. It says in Philippians 4, 6-7, Be careful for nothing, 
But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So when you got saved, you got peace with God. After you're saved, you get the peace of God by walking in the light. It says in Isaiah 26.3, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. That's the peace of God. And Philippians 4.8-9, If you want to have peace, think on these things. Philippians 4.8-9, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, throw the news out. It's not true. Throw most of the articles on the internet out. Most of it's not true. Most of it's a lot of fear-mongering, a lot of exaggerating. There's truth in that. There, you can find truth in the news. You can find truth in the articles on the internet. But when you sit and dwell on that, it's going to just bring fear and anxiety and anxiousness. Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure... Well, so everything's are lovely. A lot, most of the stuff you're thinking about is not honest, just, pure, or lovely. Whatsoever things are of good report. If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. A lot of people, all they're doing is sitting around thinking about the coronavirus. The government's going to shut me down. The government's going to kill me. The government's going to get a hold of me. That's what a lot of Christianity has become. It's people thinking about that. And when you sit down with another Christian, you want to talk about the Bible, they're just talking about, oh, what am I going to do? I got to get the vaccine. Or I'm worried about I got to get the vaccine. I'm worried about the coronavirus is going to kill me. I'm worried about they're going to take away our freedom. The Bible says think on these things. You're not staying in perfect peace. Your mind is worried about this kingdom down here, this false kingdom corrupt kingdom down here on this earth you're all ever since like i mean that i've noticed since trump was in office uh, christians have got so much more political and that's just all they talk about all they think about but if you get back to the bible you're going to have perfect peace what you think about can take away your peace and you can let what someone says work you up into a rage, a depression, a state of bitterness. Just one short phone call <coughs> can ruin your day if you let it because you're not thinking on these things. You have to quit thinking about these ty uh, the types of things that just cause you uh, just... To get in a rage and bitter all the time. We have to quit thinking about those type of things. Keep your focus on Jesus Christ and the book. And you'll be in a lot better mindset. You'll turn out a lot better. Paul said, I think myself happy. That's a great verse. I think myself happy. And then he tells you what to think about. In Philippians 4, 8 through 9. So this was the Philippians overview. We're, we're moving right along through the New Testament.